Bill Heard from Hackaday. Today we're going to be programming a CPLD from start to finish. Here's a small selection of FPGA and uh, CPLD boards. Uh, this one's an Altera FPGA, and you see a lot of pins broken out on it. Uh, this is Altera. This is cool. You can do high-level uh, uh, video uh, programming on that, real high-level stuff. You don't have to worry about the color planes and stuff. It tracks everything for you. We've got a lattice. Uh, oh, this one I did a couple years ago. This is a full uh, video-based uh, DSP system where uh, the processor and the DSP work was all put in a PGA form. And here's one I'm working on right now. This happens to be a CPLD, but it's 144 uh, pins. It's got a co close-coupled SRAM on this one, and I also have another version that's got uh, uh, some level converters on it. So let's start with him. I wanted to take a moment and show you the board that I designed up here for our little test. Um, it's, it's not hugely complicated. Uh, this is a, it is a four-layer board, uh, but it took me about an hour to lay out the power supply uh, and, and the multiple voltages for that, and then an hour with the auto router, constraining the auto router to come up with this. But what I wanted to show you is you see these CPLDs and FPGAs these days are, have multiple voltages, and in a standard four-layer board, you would put VCC on one layer and ground on another. They usually say to make the ground on top, it lowers the uh, inductance up the top components and adds a ground shielding um, value to, to some of the components on the top of the board. Um, but when you have three voltages, including ground, what do you do? So I wanted to show you that. Let me uh, turn on some layers here and See if we can turn off a layer. So this is a combination of the inner two layers where there's no really, there's no signals on here other than this is a power supply. And this happens to be the 1.8 volt supply for the CPLD. And so the 3.3 comes in on one of the layers, but you have to break up the layers. So these two colors are where I jump from layer to layer so I don't uh, you know, constrict, you know, constrict the pass from getting through, and also to keep the impedance down, multiple exits. But when you have a loop like this, uh, the noise can't hit the end of the line and bounce back, and, and the impedance doesn't go up suddenly at the end and stuff like that. So uh, this is just kind of like the only rule when you deal with these, not the only rule, but this is a major rule to, when you're dealing with these parts is to get them a good supply. So let's move on from here, and uh, let's see if we can get this thing working. So here we are inside the design software called Cordis for Altera brand of uh, CPLDs. And what I did do is I did look up the pin numbers, and I created output pins, and I've labeled them LEDs. They hooked to some LEDs on the board I just showed you. And then we've got an input pin, which is for the clock input. And what I'd like to do is make a counter that counts the 50 megahertz. So it's, you know, it's kind of a high speed there for if, trying to view with your, the, the human eye. Um, so we're going to divide that down to some LEDs and uh, should be able to see the LED blinking at some point if we slow it down enough. So the first thing I need to do is uh, in the in almost all the PGAs and PLD architectures, there's a global clock, a clock that runs to every flip-flop in the place to where all you have to do is set a bit to turn it on. And this tries to eliminate the skew of the clocks across the chip. If you took the output of things and ran it to the input of clocks, you'd get a big mess. So they always tell you, don't, don't make the input of a clock be due to a combinational logic. It should be this global clock. So let's make this a global clock. So I'm going into Altera primitives, uh, buffer, let's try there, global. Here I've opened the assignment editor for the whole part. This is cool because I can see <laughs> the shape of the part in case you forgot, but where my pins are located. And there's a concept here that says that these are in I.O. banks, input-output banks, and actually the banks are programmable as a bank, as to I can set one to be 3 volt, 3.3 volts, and another one to be 2.5. So I've got a clock going in here, and I'm using some, some output pins right up here. And so down below, what I did was I, I named the, the, the pin out 138 because uh, I, knew, I knew I wanted it on pin 138. The PC board's done. 
Then when I went in and picked the actual pin number for the part, I made 138 equal to 138. So that's just my way of saying, hey, I've pre-assigned a pin, but, but they better hook together when you're done. And then we also have some other things. You can see the different voltages that we can do here and uh, uh, low voltage TTL, low voltage CMOS. Uh, I don't see any um, um, low voltage differential there. And then we also can set some of the output current drive. Now this is a simple device. Trust me, this list would be a way, uh, is a lot longer in a, in a more modern FPGA. So we're all done with the assignments, which takes us back to the top. So we're gonna all right. And so next we need our counter. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here and I'm going to do a file new Verilog HDL file. And bear with me while I type this. So I'm not putting resets or any of those things that you're always, always supposed to have in there. Uh, this is just bare bones for a, t for a demonstration here. And yes, I type much slower since I lost my finger. All right, so we're going to save the Verilog file. We just did, matter of fact, I'll just do a save all. And now I'm going to there's the file. And now we're going to just right click on it and create a symbol file and it's going to fire up the compiler real quick. So let's, uh, let's install that uh, symbol that we just made. And yes, it's the encounter. All right. See if we can do a little bump and run here. Oh yeah, I love it. All right, I'll save all. And we are going to set the parameter. So there was one value, I didn't describe it, but I embedded the ability to program the width of the counter. So the counter is, is now 63 uh, flip-flops wide, so to speak, and I just I, I always try and use buses and try and use these spanned values like this whenever I can, including in real deep in D8, DSP type stuff. So let's uh, see if this works. Excellent, the compilation is done. Glad I didn't have to do that by hand. And uh, let's throw it over to the workstation on the bench and download it, see if it works. Here's the programming part of the Quartus software. So the first challenge is always getting the USB blaster to, uh, to be seen, especially in the X64 world. And maybe I'll blog about the specifics of that. Uh, there, excellent. So we go ahead, add that as the hardware. And this is the part, if you design these boards that you always cross your fingers for, and when it sees your device, it's a, it's a woohoo moment. So, woohoo! All right, let's uh, associate this with a file that we want to program it. Output files, keep up with me. And don't wear your glasses one time. Okay, here the download finished and immediately the LED started blinking, which is what all this has been about, all this programming, just to make some LEDs blink. Uh, in this case, you can see that it is embedded in the flash. I, I can power cycle it without having to uh, reload, the, reload it from the programmer. So let's review a little bit. We started with uh, the part shown here, which is a, a, a CPLD device from Altera. This is a 570 device, again, 144 pin, flash-based. And inside of it are, is an array of logic blocks. So here's, here's what a typical logic block looks like. These are reconfigurable. They have things like uh, adder mode and stuff. 
but pretty much it's, it's what you see here. There's some lookup tables and there's clock selectors and that kind of thing. And it's, it's basically the uh, jack of all trades block for this device. And what, we, what the uh, compiler does is take your code and figure out the best way to use these blocks to accomplish what you told it to do. So in this case, it's this Verilog file as we see here. And uh, this is extremely simple. That's why actually I wanted to type it right in front of you. Was this is and nothing more than at the positive edge of the clock, take whatever's in the value and add one to it. So you heard me say I didn't do resets or anything like that. Well, in real life, we, would, we want it to start from a known position in real life, but we also want it to start from a known position so we can simulate it. Uh, I also pushed down the width of it. You see param equals seven here. Seven just happens to be a default. From the top sheet, I told it 63, which means 64 bits. And that means I can call this counter over and over again using different widths just by specifying different widths on the top sheet. And that, that makes sense because that's where I'm going to see the bus width so I can look and say, ah, there's a bus of 64 lined up with a counter of 64. So this wasn't meant to be an end-all be-all of CPLDs, of course. I just wanted to go through each of the steps once because I'm convinced that you too can program a uh, CPLD. The software is free, and really at this point, the, the hard part's getting the, um, finding a board that's, that's just a simple CPLD board. So I'm going to be on the lookout of some of those for you. All right, that brings us to the end of uh, uh, programming a CPLD. That went by kind of quick, but that was the point. We did one of everything all the way through, and, uh, and the point is you can do this if you haven't done a programmable logic before. So uh, who knows, in a year from now, maybe we'll be making our own arithmetic uh, logic units, or if we can get into the DSP stuff, that'd be really cool, or some cool things you can do. So meanwhile, Bill heard from Hackaday, and uh, if you have a mind to, keep hacking.